He marches 21 steps south down a 63 foot long black mat. Then 21 steps down the mat and he turns and faces the east for 21 seconds. He turns and faces the south. He changes the weapon that is on his shoulder to the outside shoulder, waits 21 seconds, repeats the routine until another soldier relieves him of his duty at the changing of the guards. All of this takes place in Arlington National Cemetery. But he's guarding a tomb that on it states the words, here rest in honored glory an American soldier known but to God. And it's from this that I take my title this evening, Known But to God. This year at Westchester Church, I believe that God has placed within my spirit a theme for this year, and the theme is known. We live in a world that desires to be celebrity, seen, famous, known. But that's not the definition of known that I'm preaching about this evening. The world does not revolve around us. If it is, then something is majorly wrong. If we were the marquee event of life, how do we explain the challenges like death and disease, rumors of war and rumbling earthquakes? If God's existence is to please us, then shouldn't we always be pleased? Perhaps our place is not at the center of the universe. God does not exist to make a big deal out of you. God does not exist to make a big deal out of me because it's not about you and it's not about me. We exist for one reason and our existence is to make a big deal out of God. It's not about me and it's not about you and it's all about Him. And the reason why we come from different places, the reason why we go through different things, the reason why there are so many different elements that may attach themselves to our lives is to show the power of God in any situation. We are born, we are born with a default drive of selfishness. I want a spouse that makes me happy. I want co-workers that always ask my opinion. I want weather that suits me and traffic that helps me and a government that's all about serving me. It's all about me. We relate to advertisements with the headlines such as, I want to express myself. We want to read books about self-help, self-promotion, self-preservation, self-centeredness. It's all about me. What if a symphony, an orchestra, followed this same approach? Can you imagine an orchestra with an all-about-me mentality? Each artist clamoring for self-expression. Tubas blasting nonstop, percussions pounding to get attention. The cello shoves out the flutist on the center stage chair. The trumpets are standing on top of the conductor's stool to be seen and heard above all else. The conductor is ignored. Sheet music is disregarded. And all you have is an aimless tune-up session. No harmony. No joy. Are the musicians happy in this group whenever the concert starts? Who enjoys contributing to chaos? You don't, and I don't, and we don't. We are not made to live this way, but yet we do this every single day in our lives. No wonder our homes are so noisy. No wonder that businesses are so stress-filled. No wonder the government is cutthroat, and there is no harmony in our world. Because we think that it's all about us. And I think it's all about me. And you think it's all about you. And we have no hope for medley. We have the self-centered life. And we miss the God-centered life. 
because we think it's all about us. But yet the scripture says of Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, and made himself, I love this, made himself of no reputation, and took upon himself the form of a servant, and made in the likeness of men, in a world that wants to be known, in a world that wants to make a name for themselves. In a world that wants to be famous, the God of all creation became a man, made himself of no reputation, but took upon himself the form of a servant. The names of those buried in the tomb of the unknown are not the only thing that is unknown. Their rank is unknown. The level that they achieved in the United States military is unknown. There are so many things that are unknown. Therefore, the man that guards this tomb, the man that walks that mat, the man who guards the tomb of the unknown, whenever you see him walking, the man with whom people from all over the world come to view him walk, he carries no rank with him. You cannot look at him and say, oh, that's a sergeant, that's a lieutenant, because there's fear. I don't want to outrank the man in the tomb, or I don't want to underrank the man in the tomb, and since I don't know his rank, I'm going to do away with all of my rank, because if he's unknown, I am going to be unknown as well. They made themselves of no reputation. And the scripture goes on to say, in being found in the fashion of a man, he humbled himself. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death in the death of the cross, wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. The man Christ Jesus did not make himself known, but rather he made himself a servant. He did not exalt himself, but rather he was highly exalted by God. For he said in Luke chapter 14 and 11, Jesus said, for whosoever, whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Peter would write very similar words in 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7. Whenever he says, humble yourself, humble yourself. If I'm going to be humbled, I want to humble myself. I don't want God to do it. I'll take, I'll take that responsibility. It says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. The humility is your part. The exaltation is God's part. He said, humble yourself. Tonight, I hope that I come to you humbly and pray that the message that I believe that God has instructed me to give to you this evening will be exalted in your souls and in your spirit. And I promise you that I have searched my soul for the right words this evening. I believe that the hourglass of this dispensation is about to run out. You don't need another great sermon in your life. You don't need another great strategy in your life. And I fear that there is a personal, personal, spiritual deterioration in our world in religious circles, and even in some of the lives that sit in this room this evening. I fear, and please listen to pastor right now, I fear that we have become cold, we have become callous, and we have become unmoved to the voice of God. I fear that we have gotten so caught up in the noise that all of a sudden we have become our own spiritual experts and we know exactly what we want to hear, when we want to hear it, and how we want it presented. And thus we have learned to tune out the things that we don't want to hear from God. We have become caught up in a social media generation where everyone has a voice and you can find anything that you want to hear. The Christian church has become more political and less prayerful. We are more concerned with the noise of Washington than the noise of heaven. We care more about the words of politicians than we do the Prince of Peace. 
this evening, I've come to bring a word of warning that it's time to cut out the noise. We've been looking to the left, and we've been looking to the right, and we've been looking around too long. It's time to set our face like a flint and say, I've got, so I've got some marching to do, so I can't be concerned with what's going on over here, and I can't be concerned with what's going on over here. I have a mission, and my mission is the gospel, and nothing shall move me. If we're going to have revival in our world, it will begin whenever we eliminate the distractions, cut out the noise, and finally find a place alone with God. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, but you, but you, when you pray, when you pray, go to your room, shut the door. Pray to your Father who's in a secret place, and he who sees in secret will reward you openly. I want a revival in the world, but what I'm learning is that revival doesn't happen in staff meetings. Revival happens in prayer meetings. It doesn't begin on Facebook. It begins when your face is in the book. When was the last time you went to your room and shut your door and began to pray? When was the last time you found a secret place and you got shut in with God and you allowed tears to flow down your face in prayer? When was the last time you cut out the noise? When was the last time you went to prayer without your phone? When was the last time you went to prayer without social media in the background? When was the last time the only thing that could be heard in your prayer closet was your voice lifting up to heaven saying, I need a sound from heaven and I need it right now. It's not about me, and it's not about you, and it's all about him. And if there's ever a day where the church needs a clear sound from heaven, it's this day, because there's a lot of voices. John the Baptist finds himself in prison in Herod's death camp, denouncing the king's immorality, awaiting his own demise, and he had time to reflect. So he sends two disciples who say to Jesus, are you the coming one or do we need to look for another? Are you the Messiah? Are you who we've been expecting? Or do we need to look for someone else? John lived a heroic life. It was about to end and he wonders, is it all worth it? After all, he had the opportunities to be a modern day celebrity. And now he's a prisoner. If Jesus is the Messiah, why am I in prison? And Jesus says, I want you to go tell John that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached, and blessed is he who is not offended because of me. John, you paved the way for me. Miracles happened. Masses were heard, and John, whatever the cost has been, it's worth it all because the gospel is preached. Because John lies accepting invitation, he accepted the invitation to move among the dying. And because of what you have done, John, they will get my blessing. I always find it interesting. In Hebrews chapter 11, how it ends in verse 36, when it says uh, the first two words, and others, and others, the unknown to us, but the well-known to God, it says, and others, after by faith Noah, by faith Abraham, by faith uh, by faith Enoch, uh, by faith Rahab, by faith these great people. Then it says, and others had trial of cruel mockeries and scornings. Yea, moreover the bonds of imprisonment. They were stoned and sawed asunder. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword. They wandered in sheepskin and goatskin, being destitute, affiliated, and tormented. Of whom the world was not worthy. They wandering in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. 
And these all, these unnamed people, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. Westchester Church, don't get offended when what we do seems insignificant in comparison next to the pomp and circumstance of religious America. Don't get offended when others don't see the value of being small. Don't get offended when God asks you to leave comfortable places to live among the dying for his kingdom. Now's not the time, John, to seek stardom. It's time to decrease so that he may increase. We don't know the measure of our impact, and we may never know the measure of our impact. We just step toward the door, and we make an impact on behalf of dying men. And if I have to choose, I would rather be known to God than known to man. And while the two disciples were walking away, Jesus starts talking about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, he who wears soft garments are in king's houses. But that's not what John is. This is what John is. What did you go to see? A prophet. Yes, even more than a prophet. For he is whom the prophets written, Behold, I will send a messenger before my face, and he will prepare a way. A man known to God, a person known to God, gives themselves away so that others can be pointed to Jesus. More, Jesus said that John was a prophet, but he wasn't just a prophet. He was more than a prophet. He was a prophet that others prophesied about. And here's what it gets me. John never hears these words. Jesus is bragging on John, and John never hears the words. Because the two disciples that came to ask Jesus, is this really all it is? And Jesus' response was, tell them the blind see. Tell them the lame walk. Tell them the gospel is preached. Tell them these things. These two men turn around and walk away. Jesus walks to the other side and begins to say, yeah, the guy that they just came from, John, he's, a, he's more than a prophet. He, he's actually Elias who has come. He is way more than a prophet. But John never hears the words. Because the truth is, is that sometimes God will never let you read your own headline simply because he wants you to remember it's not about you. We want to see the end result before we step toward the door. We want to make sure it's going to work before we put our faith out there. We want to make sure that something's going to happen. John never hears Jesus' affirmation on earth, and we may never either, because God is looking for people who desire what he desires, people who are willing to, gl to gl allow the glory of their name to fade into oblivion so that the glory of his name will become shiningly bright. John got it right earlier in his ministry. In John chapter 3, in verse 27, he said, A man can receive nothing unless it had been given him from heaven. And he goes on to say, I am not the Christ. I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. I love this. It says, he must increase. I must decrease. I am not Christ. He must increase. If I have to choose, I don't want to be a person who gets in the way of God's glory. I want to be a person who points people to God's glory. I don't want to be known. I want him to be known. If I have to choose, I want our church to point people to Jesus. I want us to point our neighbors to Jesus. I want to point people to Jesus.
Brother Nathan, don't raise your hand on this. Has anybody ever heard of a company called BBDO? BBDO. Anybody ever heard of BBDO? Okay, one, two, three, four, the majority. How how about uh, Snap, Crackle, Pop? Snap, Crackle, Pop? So you've heard of Snap, Crackle, Pop? But you haven't heard of BBDO? BBDO created Snap, Crackle, Pop. BBDO is an advertising agency, actually. Brother Nathan works for them. Advertising agency. The advertising agency's job is not to make a name for themselves. The advertising agency is to make a name for someone else. We are not ambassadors of ourselves. We are ambassadors of Christ. Our job is not to make a name for ourselves. Our job is to make a name for Christ. Musicians can come, you can guys get this ready. He must increase, and I must decrease. So whenever I think, whenever I begin to think about this year in 2020, I, the scripture came to my mind. If I will be lifted up, then I will draw all men unto me. And so our goal is one fold, and that is lift up the name of Jesus. We want Jesus to be seen. And whenever Jesus is seen, people are going to be looking for a place to go. And whenever they come to us, when they come to Westchester Church, you know what they're going to look for? They're going to say, I heard that Jesus is here. Can you introduce me to Jesus? When God looks at the center stage of the universe, he doesn't look at you. When heaven's stage hands directs the spotlight toward the star of the show, I need no sunglasses. No light falls on me. Lesser orbits, that's us. We are appreciated. We are valued. We are loved dearly. Yes. But central, essential, pivotal, no way. Like, well, that's real building up, Pastor. (laughs) I love what Mike and Mike said about how the kingdom of God is going to advance, whether we're a part of it or not. The kingdom of God is going to advance. But I want to make sure that I play the part, whatever God has for me. I want to make sure Westchester Church plays the part, whatever God has for us. But the only way to do that he must increase and we must decrease for if we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God he will exalt us in due time